new knowledge and skills, the ability to develop and exploit new technologies, as well as understanding how technology and society interact are all critical success factors that universities can contribute to in this ongoing process of change. In addition, sustainable development is an imperative for our future with a sustainable development path presupposing groundbreaking innovations in the years to come. We need to experiment more across disciplines and sectors in our search for new and more effective ideas for a sustainable future. To discuss more around these lines, we have invited a panel of industry experts to discuss international dimensions of universities' contribution to innovation. I would like to invite T. Radhakrishna, editor South ET Government, to moderate the discussion. Over to you, Radhakrishna. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the panel discussion on the theme of international dimension of universities contribution to innovation, which is part of the second edition of Education Innovation and Skill Summit 2021. The challenges facing universities before COVID-19 have not gone away, but the pandemic has shown the, that the sector can adapt at a pace. Greater openness, collaborations and innovation can help institutions carve out a new identity a global pandemic has few silver linings, but the but for higher education, it has been an opportunity to show that universities can, universities can adapt rapidly. How can higher education or in university education thrive post-pandemic? To take discussion forward, I am joined by eminent academicians who won national and international awards for their outstanding contributions in the field of higher education. Today's my first guest is uh, Professor Peter Hodge, AC, President and Vice Chancellor of University of Adelaide from Australia. Professor Hodge has more than 20 years senior leadership experience in higher education and research. Prior to that, he was Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Queensland and the University of South Australia. He was educated at the University of Copenhagen, a measuring in biochemistry and chemistry and has Master of Science degree in Biochemistry and Genetics and a PhD in Photosynthesis. Professor Hodge commenced in February 2021 as the University of Adelaide 24th Vice Chancellor and President. Professor Hodge, welcome to the panel discussion. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. My second guest, uh, Professor Sandeep Gopalan, Vice Chancellor, Carolina University from USA. Professor Sandeep Gopalan is a Vice Chancellor and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and International, Carolina University from USA. He was previously the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Innovation at Deakin University, Australia. Professor Gopalan has been a leader in legal education, serving as Dean of Law Schools and a Law Professor in Australia and Ireland. Prior to that, he was an associate professor at law schools in the US and UK. Before commencing his academic career, he was an investment banker on the Wall Street and a lawyer. Professor Gopalan has served as a chairman of the Arizona Aerospace and Defense Commission, member of the Tempe Aviation Commission, co-chair of the American Bar Association Aerospace and Defense Industry Committee and Insolvency and Restructuring Committee. Uh, professor Gopalan was educated at the Oxford University and where he was a, a Rhodes Scholar at and at the National Law School of India, Professor Sandeep Goparan, welcome to the panel discussion. Thank you very much indeed. My third guest today uh, is uh, Professor Tan Chi, Tanning Chi, President of National University of Singapore. Uh, Professor Tanning Chi was appointed President of the National University of Singapore on January 1st, 2018. He is the university's fifth president and the 23rd leader to head Singapore's oldest higher education institution. Professor Tan, who attended Raffles Institution, obtained his bachelor's degree in mathematics at National University of Singapore and his PhD at Yale University. He joined NUS as a faculty member in the Department of Mathematics in 1985 as a senior tutor and has held visiting for positions at various universities overseas, such as the Rutgers University, the University of Washington at Seattle, University of California at Berkeley and University of Maryland, USA, Universities of Tokyo, Kyoto, Japan. 
Professor Tan is a member of Singapore's Future Economic Council, which is tasked with the driving the growth and the transformation of the country's future economy. He is the chair of Universita 21, a leading global network of 27 research intensive universities. Professor Tan, uh, welcome to the panel discussion. Thank you very much for having me. My fourth and last uh, guest is uh, Professor Danjay Jari, Vice President of University of Mauritius. And uh, Professor Danjay Jari was appointed Vice Chancellor on March 6, 2017. He received his PhD in Polymer Chemistry in 1992 from Bordeaux, one university from France. After spending initial years uh, working in France on biomedical polymers, in December 1994, he joined the Department of Chemistry at the University of Mauritius as a lecturer and was appointed professor in 2005. He held the post of National Research Chair in um, Biometrials and Drug Delivery under the Mauritius Research Council from 2012 to 16. He founded and headed the Center for Biomedical Biomaterial Research, a center attached to the University of Mauritius from 2011 to 2016. He has received various national and international awards and recognition, including the, the first Best Mauritian Scientist Award 2011. Professor, Danjajari, welcome to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be a part of you. My first question to Professor Peter Hodge, AC. Professor, your initial remarks on the experiences in pandemic times, key decisions taken by your office, alignment of higher education with the industry and the landmarks, if any, can please. So the first observation that I have had uh, is that we had for a long time understood that digital advances would have to change the way that we taught our students. Uh, the pandemic uh, forced us to accelerate uh, developments uh, in this area, particularly for many universities in Australia, which have a very large number of international students, uh, perhaps 30% of the total student body, and those students could not travel to Australia. So within one or two weeks, most Australian universities managed to convert most of its traditional lecturing to online classes, uh, uh, and uh, in our case, 98%. Uh, and we probably did in less than a month, which might have taken us uh, 10 years to do under normal circumstances. So whilst we all would have liked to be without the pandemic crisis, uh, there is uh, this old notion that sometimes a crisis forces innovation to accelerate. And I think that we will never truly go back to what we were before we will, as an institution, have to retain uh, the learnings that we made, refine them, and find what the best optical, optimal mix of new tuition looks like. This is certainly what the pandemic has taught me. Thank you, Professor. Uh, over to Professor Sandeep Gopalan. Your initial <coughs> remarks on the experiences in pandemic times, key decisions taken by your office, alignment of higher education with the industry and landmark, any landmark achievements, uh, if any, please, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from and learn from very smart people here. Um, I want to pick up from a, a thread that uh, the previous speaker spoke about, which is the focus on what tuition is likely to be and what the value proposition for a student going to, to university in a pandemic disrupted time is likely to be. And, and again, what we have done is highly influenced by our context. And, and that context in the US is one where there is tremendous disparity of educational and health attainment in the population, right? Even uh, within the South of the United States, uh, educational attainment lags the Northeast and the West Coast. And, and the same correlations exist in health and other outcomes. So what we really did in, an, in the pandemic um, amidst the disruption is really focus on what is the value proposition for a student. And, and that question, again, is related to the broader context and dissonance in this country about how higher education is beyond the reach and is um, not affordable to the average student, which, of course, has manifested in, in huge uh, college debt in this country, right? So college debt 
is the second category of debt in the US after mortgage debt uh, in excess of $1.3 trillion um, held uh, in this country. And despite which we have upwards of 35 million people who have college debt, but no college degrees. So uh, there was always disquiet in the sector about how higher education has failed to meet the needs of both industry and more widely the population at large. And to some extent, the pandemic brought some of these questions to a head, um, especially in the sense that students who were now suddenly forced to go online started asking difficult questions about why they should pay $40,000 a year in tuition to sit behind a computer and, and listen to a Zoom lecture. So this manifested in, in very many different ways across the country in universities, some of which got sued. I mean, some major universities in this country uh, are facing litigation for refunds and uh, return of money for essentially a Zoom lecture, which is uh, exponentially um, uh, the cost of what it should be and so on. So amidst all of that bedlam, we try to look at what the value for the student is and calibrated our value proposition so that we did not saddle students with a lot of debt for products that they did not actually consume. So in other words, if we focused our tuition and, and real operating cost basis on what the student actually wants in a highly digital environment, it allowed us to be more competitive in terms of what the value was for the student who chose to come to us. As a result, we saw significant growth despite the pandemic when the sector as a whole in the US um, in some cases collapsed and, and had double digit declines in enrollment. So we grew despite that because of that focus on value. The second thing we did is Again, in this country, the context shows uh, disadvantaged groups struggle with basic capabilities like language. For, for instance, the Latino population in this country, which is growing, has severe access challenges to higher education. So one of the moves we made this year is to provide the first year of the college experience in dual Spanish and English mode for those who want it. Right. So for students who are from Latino backgrounds, but also from South America and Central America who were coming as international students, one of the key challenges for them was the language um, of being new in a country, coping with college level English and so on. So we tried to offer a dual language Spanish option for those kinds of students to mitigate some of those risks. And thirdly, we made a much greater um, uh, uh, sort of causal relationship between our degree programs and what the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US was predicting as skills gaps for the next 10 years. So we took a chance and really worked on curriculum reform to better align every one of our products within that 10 year horizon of jobs uh, demands. So those were some of the three um, things that we took uh, major steps in during the pandemic. And I think uh, the vindication for those is our growth in terms of enrollment and, and both in terms of numbers, but also in the quality of our students. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Professor Sandeep. Uh, over to Professor Tan. Uh, you are experiences in pandemic times and the key decisions taken by your office, alignment of higher education with the industry and landmarks, uh, achievements, if any, over to you. Uh, my experiences are actually quite similar to my two uh, sort of uh, colleagues we have just mentioned. Uh, I had also the advantage that I had been provost for 11 years before I took over as president. And uh, since when I was a provost, uh, I'm, we are very mindful of the impact of Industry 4.0. And COVID-19 uh, has basically accelerated a lot of these changes. Uh, we foresee actually our economy and our industry transforming, right? Uh, and uh, it is actually very... Uh, uh, Urgent is an urgent need for the university and our graduates to be transformed. So uh, we are pushing very strongly a few key initiatives. The first one is to integrate lifelong learning into uh, the DNA of our graduates. Uh, I think we know that uh, 
a four-year education would not be enough to prepare a career lifespan of 45 to 50 years. Uh, you need to have this uh, lifelong learning as part of your DNA. Uh, so we started in 2018 with a promise that uh, our students and our graduates will be able to access our programs and courses uh, for 20 years after their graduation. And uh, this is the first initiative to integrate what we call pre-employment training, which is university training, and uh, to integrate with uh, CET, Continuing Education and Training. The second initiative is really to speed up uh, technology-enhanced learning. So we are investing quite substantially and uh, we are hoping to, over the next four years, to convert all courses with enrollment more than 100 into blended uh, learning, uh, which means that students would be able to access materials online uh, in bite-sized videos, but they come for face-to-face -face workshops and tutorials uh, to complement and to enhance their learning. Uh, and uh, we do that for all classes with enrollment about uh, above 100. And that would take care of about 750 modules. So we are hoping to convert all this within the next four years uh, into blended uh, courses. So that's our second push. Uh, the third push is to ensure that our graduates can be more agile and more adaptable. And here, uh, it is important that uh, they have a broad intellectual foundation and uh, also they would have multiple competencies uh, as display, displayed by uh, double majors and with the possibility when you have continuing education, graduates coming in to do micro-credentials to top up or to add depth to some of their uh, uh, expertise. And uh, so uh, just within the last year, uh, I have formed the College of Humanities and Sciences, which is a collaboration between the two biggest faculties, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Sciences. And their students would go through a common curriculum and each year there'll be 2,300 of them. And uh, I, will, I have also merged the Faculty of Engineering and the School of Design and Environment into the College of Design and Engineering because design and engineering has very strong intellectual overlap. And this college uh, takes in about 2,000 students. Uh, so by next year, uh, all our sort of undergraduate courses would come under a similar framework where students will go through a common curriculum before deciding uh, their major. And one important aspect of the common curriculum is that uh, it is all interdisciplinary. Uh, we do not want to teach subjects in single disciplines, but we want to expose students to interdisciplinarity. This helps them in complex problem solving. So these are the three key initiatives that uh, NUS has pushed over the last few years. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Tan. Uh, over to Professor Dande Jerry. Sir, your initial uh, remarks uh, on your experiences in pandemic times and landmark, landmark achievements, if any, if you can elaborate. Well, uh, the, the, the chance of speaking uh, after uh, my, my three colleagues is, uh, is for me to have an overview of what's going on uh, elsewhere in the world. And so I'm happy to note that, uh, you know, uh, for I think one of the first time in the history of universities, all universities, be it in the East, West, North and South are talking the same language. So that's the beauty. We often say that uh, we often talk in terms of North versus South, but here we're all talking the same language and we all are facing the same problems. Fortunately, when we went in lockdown uh, in March 2020, we had only some two or three weeks lectures remaining for our second semester. So uh, it was not a big problem. And indeed, we could switch overnight to uh, online delivery. 
uh, not because we, uh, we, we had computers and we could do that easily, but because we had instituted in 2019, uh, we changed our credit system and moved to the learner credit, uh, centered uh, credit system, which is uh, more of independent learning, which is more technology uh, uh, embedded. So we started giving our students a feel of the blended learning. And uh, uh, about 50 to 60% of our programs were on a blended mode already. So it wasn't that difficult to switch to the uh, online modes. But saying that, uh, we started the second, uh, the, the academic year 2020, 2021 on a fully blended mode. Uh, so that was important. But then we started realizing a number of issues, uh, how to deliver. Uh, on uh, science-based programs, on, on engineering programs or agriculture programs where we need a lot of practicals. And if you're in lockdown, how, we do, how do we do that? So uh, the technical skills that are very important today, it's not just about knowledge that we impart to our students, it's about the technical skills, uh, is something that we need, we had to reflect upon. How do we do that in such a manner that our students are well-trained? Uh, 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 some of our, of, our, of, our, uh, of our programs needed the students to go and have a place, placement with industry, which couldn't happen during the lockdown. So we had to find ways and means to do that. And online delivery cannot satisfy everything. So uh, that was also a problem that we had to face and try to find solutions. Uh, another issue of uh, the online delivery is that, uh, uh, you know, people tend to switch from the normal uh, lecture delivery uh, to a PowerPoint delivery, uh, which is not necessarily, uh, you know, the, the essence of online. So that was also something that we have uh, discussed a lot at our meetings, at our Senate meetings, and try to find solutions uh, and try to convince, you know, academics that they really need to change the way they deliver. It's not just a PowerPoint presentation and we say we are on, we're doing online. So uh, all these issues were uh, real issues we had to reflect upon and we haven't necessarily found the solutions to all of them. But one thing is important is that the pandemic, as my colleagues said previously, had accelerated the transformation. And on our side, we were contemplating on that digital transformation, which is you know, the, 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 the wave, the next wave of universities. And uh, we were able to accelerate to the digital transformation, but not just looking at uh, uh, the teaching and learning, but looking at, uh, looking at digital transformation in a, in a three-pronged approach, uh, looking at uh, the tools that we need, looking at the processes and looking at the people. So it's not a matter just of the students, it's also about the staff working because many are working from home and how do we provide them with the necessary tools? How do we ensure that the processes are uh, uh, you know, right on target? Uh, those are things that we have also looked into and we're still looking into. We've not uh, found solutions to all of them and we're still looking into uh, you know, a, a, a smart way of doing things and uh, uh, you know, a transition that is uh, uh, not too brutal to, uh, to our staff as well. So uh, all these issues are uh, important issues we've been looking into, but there is another aspect that is also important. And we have talked, uh, uh, um, uh, Professor Tan uh, invoked, uh, 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 you know, the, the aspect of uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, we're now into Industry 5.0. And what do we say? We say that technology is, is not the only essence we, we need also to inculcate the right mindset into people. And we also need to look into sustainability. So these are things also that uh, we uh, have uh, built upon the pandemic to bring in the forefront of our universities. Uh, uh, getting our students to the right mindset is very important. Uh, uh, this, this is part of the soft skills that we have to uh, you know, uh, inculcate into them. But also getting our staff and students to work on sustainability issues making sustainability uh, you know as a central part of the university and using the sdgs as a framework 
was also an important, uh, uh, I would not say shift, it was not a radical shift, we were, we were already working on that, but it had building on the pandemic and saying to people, we are in a new normal, was a, a, a way to make them believe in changes, to make them adopt changes. So that was also important uh, uh, for us. So briefly, uh, digital transformation, inculcating the right mindset, and thirdly, uh, uh, you know, putting sustainability in the center of what we do was something that uh, 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 we uh, took advantage of the pandemic, I must say, if I, if I can say that. Thank you, Professor. Uh, over to Professor uh, Hodge, uh, many universities across the world developed a lot of short-term courses and long-term courses in order to increase uh, their newer audience or to expand their base. Uh, your university, uh, University of Adelaide, uh, is one of the most oldest universities in the world, almost 185 years. Yes. Do you see that collaborations and innovations are uh, in need today, universities to expand their reach by using the, their blended courses, tying up with the industry and edutech companies? I, I see that the developments we all have talked about using the digital will bring education into the reach of many people who couldn't do it before. So for example, uh, in the last 50 to 100 years, people have had to travel to a different country to get an education, often a very expensive country to live in. And I think our embracing the digital uh, and our students not being able to come to us will see us educate people uh, in a different way of blended learning. And that's a blended learning where a lot of learning will be done just online, but then it will be followed by intensive face-to-face, -face, either in our country for a short period of time or through partnerships with other universities in, in jurisdictions with a lower GDP per capita. And indeed, many Australian universities, because the students couldn't come, first we transitioned to having online learning only, but then we established overseas learning centers where the students could come and live in a cheaper economy, but at least get a student experience and then be co-taught by colleagues in overseas jurisdictions. So I think when you want to mount a course, sometimes you might actually not have the best professor to deliver a course, but you can source that in through online and exchange. Your other university partner might not have the best professor in a different type of discipline. And you pay back by contributing that so I think that university uh, education will become in reach. They'll be reachable by many more people, including many students who are not able to go to university without working. They might have to work and they can get an education through catching up through online. And I do think in many parts of the world, you will see that social cohesion will be enhanced because the difference between the very wealthy and the not so wealthy will be diminished because education is now available, not only to the elite. So I, I see this uh, online transformation as really powerful to create a better and more just world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, over to Professor Sandeep. Uh... Yeah. What are the latest uh, happening in terms of collaborations and uh, innovations at uh, universities in USA, uh, Mr. Uh, Sandeep? Thank you. Um, so again, I think once one looks at the context within which universities are operating, I think the, the question as to what we do digitally or otherwise uh, becomes salient, right? So in, in our context here, there are a couple of things which are very important, um, very significant trends that should influence and will influence what is likely to happen. The first of which is the retreat from the workforce 
of a significant number of people who otherwise would have worked in the formal sector. I mean, it's been labeled by the Wall Street Journal and others as the great resignation. So whole uh, hundreds of thousands of people who have just quit their jobs uh, and walked away from the workforce and who have not expressed any kind of intention to come back into the formal workforce. So what do you do with these people? That's one question. Secondly, coevally with the um, uh, pandemic has been a, a, a rise in the number of new businesses started, perhaps by some of these same people who have quit formal employment and decided not to work for somebody else, but for themselves. So uh, in, in some sectors, the new business filings during the pandemic are over 100% of what was seen as the average in the 15 years prior to that. I mean, that's a massive number, right? I mean, it's just in one year, uh, a 15 year stable trajectory is disrupted uh, to such a degree. And it's not just isolated to one or two sectors, it's across the board all the way from so-called retail to consulting, to accounting, to management. I mean, all kinds, of, even academia. I mean, uh, some of my colleagues will probably see this in faculty hiring. I mean, there's a whole army of the adjunct population which is not quite content, at least in the US, with being adjuncts. And, and that goes to the kind of fungible nature of work and, and, and the flexibility that it offers um, for those categories of employment. Whereas just two, three years ago, the adjunct category of work in academia was seen as a negative or a less prestigious, less desirable option, certainly in this country. I mean, there was a lot more organization uh, of adjuncts, unionization, et cetera. All of that is retreated because the, the workers themselves say that's what they prefer. So amidst all of this, uh, there's also the other trend, which is the greater degree of retirements of more older populations that were in the workforce that had stable 30, 40 career, year careers as one of the previous speakers uh, talked about. And that was what they had been educated for and prepared to become when they were in college, which is committing to a career for 30 or 40 years. I am not sure that today's graduate or today's student in a university is necessarily thinking of themselves as a worker for a company or a government or something for 30 or 40 years. I think that's to a significant proportion of this college population, that is not what they want. Right? They, they have no intention of working in a career or a job for 30 or 40 years until retirement and going away with a 401k or some retirement package. And that's, that's, that's what their life plan is. That is not the goal. Most people want to work for themselves or retire early and are actively taking steps to do so. So I think the big question is how do universities respond to those appetites of their traditional market? And how do we serve them to achieve what they are seeking to achieve? So for the retiring person, and again, retirements more than doubled than the numbers that would be typical during the pandemic, right? So I, there, I, I saw a report recently from the Federal Reserve here, which said the predicted number of retirements was about 1.5 million, but instead turned out to be 3.6 million. So that's a massive jump just because of the pandemic and whether that's due to fatigue or relocation or we don't know yet. And, and a lot of this is unknown. That's part of the other problem for a university. Is, are these just fads or trends enabled by unusual events, for example, because of the extreme amount of government stimulus money in the economy. Are these kind of blips and will there be a, a return to the normal or are these life-changing kind of events to which we should adjust? So it's really not known and, and I'm not a predictor of the future, I can't speak to it. But I think it's certainly the case that most workers and students have clearly articulated preferences for more flexible work. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity for universities to partner both with existing businesses and with new emerging areas of the economy to create that lifelong upskilling uh, and also the more humanistic rewarding elements of education in a way that has never been done before. But historically you had education that was to develop the elites and create the life of the mind and so on and so forth. Then you had the instrumental view of education to create workers. And now I think we might have a third phase where it's kind of a combination of the two. It's not just instrumental, nor is it just the development of the elites, 
but somewhere in between. So I, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's what will be one of the big conundrums of the next couple of decades for universities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sandeep. Uh, over to Professor Tan. Uh, collaborations, innovations are uh, encouraging the universities to tie up with the inter-universities, interstates, and the international. How open uh, your university to these uh, influential, significant developments? Uh, I thought I'd like to present a different slant to this on uh, collaborations. Uh, and also innovation. So uh, in, at NUS, we see innovation as a key pillar of the university. Uh, so we actually have a innovation and enterprise division of the university. Uh, we call it NUS Enterprise. And this was set up some 20 years ago, uh, in two, way back in 2001. Uh, innovation and enterprise is as important as education and uh, research, right? The twin pillars for typical universities. And to us, it is really essential for a positive social impact. Um, so we have been building entrepreneurial education uh, through international hubs. Uh, we have three in U.S., in Silicon Valley, in uh, New York City, and in Toronto. We have five in Europe, in Stockholm, Sweden, Munich, Germany, Lausanne, Switzerland, uh, Haifa, and Tel Aviv in Israel. We have three in China, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. And uh, we have about five in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in Singapore, in Jakarta, in Jakarta, in Bandung, and in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, we are setting up another one uh, in uh, Japan. And in these hubs, we actually collaborate with startups in all these cities where we put our students as interns in these startups. And they do that for the entire third year while doing uh, online programs uh, at NUS on entrepreneurship. So they have a full year of exposure on entrepreneurship in the startups, and they come back in their fourth year to complete their degree. So a lot of our students actually go into the startup uh, ecosystem uh, in Singapore and beyond. So uh, we have actually grew more than uh, 1,100 startups. And these startups have raised more than 4 billion Singapore dollars uh, over the last, in fact, most of the money raised were in the last five to seven years. And just this year alone, uh, we have two of the NUS student startups, uh, PetSnap and Carousel, uh, becoming billion dollar or US billion dollar companies or unicorns. So, we are actually trying to extend uh, our startup ecosystem by collaborating with startups in Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is of importance to Singapore because Southeast Asia itself has a growing uh, middle class population. Uh, it is increasingly digitally connected and uh, it has a population of 650 million. Uh, and uh, being able to actually build an innovation and enterprise ecosystem within Southeast Asia is something that we hope to push in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. Uh, over to Professor Ganje. Uh, how important collaborations and innovation initiatives uh, for University of Mauritius? How open are you? You know, uh, five years ago, uh, when I joined as vice chancellor, uh, the uh, in in my vision paper, I had uh, put innovation in the center of what we do at the university. Uh, that was very important. It was very important because innovation enables you to impact, whether you impact uh, at uh, you know on the on the economy, whether you impact uh, on the environment, social, whatever uh, impact. But it, it, it helps you do that. And to be able to do that, we had focused on research and entrepreneurial activities. So that was the approach. And, and with whom do we work? 
we work with the government, we work with industry, and we work with uh, the civil society. So it's a more kind of uh, not a triple helix, but a quadruple helix uh, model of uh, uh, you know innovation. And this is what we've been trying to do uh, at the university. So uh, partnership becomes very important because if you are working along that uh, uh, you know quadruple helix, uh, automatically the university works with the government bilaterally or with industry or with the civil society or works with all these partners so with the government it's important government uh, the government of mauritius puts a lot of emphasis on developing an innovative economy so it was important for us uh, you know to indulge into skilling reskilling upskilling of people so we mounted uh, you know a lot of commission programs for the governments for 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 upskilling of uh, uh, of the of the uh, uh, government servants, uh, we work very closely with industry uh, in mounting uh, joint programs with industry. Not programs that we mount and offer to industry, but we mount jointly programs that that respond to industry's needs. Uh, it was uh, five years ago not believable that we could attract uh, industry on campus. Now we have several industries on campus working closely with us in, in the digital fields, in the IT field, in AI, and that's very important. So, uh, uh, similarly, uh, we have industries investing on labs on campus. And for example, recently we had one major IT company investing on an innovation lab uh, because the company is working with us on developing new programs. So that's another type of partnership. And uh, we are able also to attract companies because more and more companies have to deliver on sustainability. Uh, I'll give you just one example. Uh, one major company approached us and says to us, uh, uh, we would like uh, uh, to find uh, a way to reprogram uh, the, the, the batteries of our electric cars, uh, which are, uh, you know, which are uh, after five years have still 90% of the efficacy or, or the efficiency. So how do we do that? Uh, so we would like to work with you. So these are kind of partnerships that we uh, that that we develop to uh, uh, to to get to uh, innovation. Uh, but another important aspect is also uh, to partner with international universities. Uh, we have uh, established strategic partnerships with uh, uh, several universities, not to mention all of them: University of Arizona in the U.S., University of uh, Paris, uh, uh, University of uh, Prince Edward Island, where we offer dual degree programs, uh, not necessarily offered at the university, and to uh, uh, to to take the uh, what Professor uh, Hoy said previously, uh, we can tap on what others are doing very well. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, we're going to offer very shortly uh, a bachelor in climate change and adaptation. Uh, that's a flagship program of the UPI, which will be offered at the University of Mauritius. We'll be offering uh, in, in, 15, in 15 days time uh, that we start the new academic year, we'll be offering a bachelor in cyber operations with the University of, uh, of Arizona. This is a very important bachelor. We also offer a bachelor in data science uh, with others. So uh, we kind of build strategic partnerships with international universities. And this is part of what we term as international education diplomacy. Uh, I think that's very important for a small country like us. Uh, we have to partner with others to be able to deliver. We cannot offer everything on our own. So, uh, so uh, online delivery, blended delivery enables us to do uh, these things. But uh, there is also an important part, important aspect of a question that you raised was on short courses. Uh, that's also something very important. We also put a lot of emphasis on, you know, building the, those short courses, those short programs that are not necessarily traditional, uh, you know, uh, bachelor or master's programs offered at university. This is extremely important because if we are to respond to uh, skilling and reskilling of our people, because you know, uh, traditional economies no longer are valid. 
we have to go to uh, new sectors of uh, of the of the economy and so we have often uh, to retrain our people so they can't embark on tr long uh, traditional uh, university programs and this is where i think uh, this aspect of short courses uh, uh, gets uh, you know its full uh, uh, its full advantage thank you thank you professor dandre uh, my last question to professor uh, hodg uh, education uh, market is considered to be very significant for Australia. Many uh, students from across the world uh, do visit uh, and, and admissions do take place in Australia. So considering that this significant market, what are your top priorities uh, going forward for this for the current academic year? If you can say? Our top priority uh, is obviously to uh, get such a large proportion of our staff, students, and wider population vaccinated so we can open up the borders and people can come here without quarantine. Uh, and um, we are progressing very strongly towards that in Australia. So I'm very confident that international students will be able to return for the start of semester one in 2020. Two, uh, without having to quarantine, assuming that we don't see uh, the global emergence uh, of a new COVID strain. So that's a top priority for us to show ourselves as leaders and certainly um, in, in our staff body, uh, the vaccination rate, would, would double vaccination rate would now be 95% and our student body is not far behind. So that's a very important thing. But the other priority is to build on some of the elements that my colleagues have been talking about. That is to refine the learnings we have made from embryonic online to much more sophisticated online, to change the way that our learning environments are. So we, we can seamlessly have a really interactive class between students who want to be in the room and students who want to be in the room digitally. Uh, we will also see, I think, going forward, that many of our education programs will be co-designed between future employers and the university. So in a sense, this very impressive uh, initiative that has been running at NUS for 20 years uh, where the students uh, can go to a global innovation hub and work while still studying online, I think will be something we will see much more. Uh, gone are the days where the universities will be the sole um, educators of future graduates. Uh, and uh, I think we will see that our university will look at different educational models where we take the best we can from employers and the best we can deliver. And employers are engaging in those conversations because uh, the war for talent is incredibly big. And I, I also agree with uh, Sandeep Gopalan that today's students uh, want something different. And uh, I have an anecdote from when we developed a new uh, student strategy at University of Queensland, we asked all the students to make submissions and 7,000 students made submissions and 55% of those students said they wanted much more entrepreneurship. And I asked a student one day at a workshop, why do you want this so badly? And they said, the world is changing so much that no employment is forever. And if I'm going to get sacked, I want to sack myself. I don't want anybody else to do that. So uh, all these things are in the mix and you will see new educational uh, products develop this way. But the other thing I will say is that uh, the whole online thing will also uh, uh, reduce the amount of ad hoc international travel that we do and domestic travel and hopefully see that we don't all jet off to a one-day meeting somewhere, uh, but that we have it online. And then all the carbon credits we get for that, we can actually come together for a week and do some real good strategic work. 
So I think there are so many exciting opportunities for us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vaj. Over to Professor Sandeep Gopalan. Um, your final words on the top end. Yeah, thank you. The, I think I also agree that the future is incredibly exciting. Um, and for some time here, um, it, it's been the case that in many industries, a college degree is optional to get a job, right? I mean, especially in the technology sector, uh, many including Google and IBM, et cetera, have explicitly said, at least publicly, that a degree is, is no longer required for many parts of, the, uh, of their workforce. And I think in that context, we've also seen the opposite side, which is uh, the rise of overqualified people in areas where degrees are not essential. The classic case being the cafe, right? The number of people who work as baristas who possess either undergraduate or postgraduate degrees in, in the Western world is, uh, has been an, uh, an, a steep upward curve in the last decade. So what, does, what do these two seemingly contradictory trends actually mean? Is it, is it the case that people are underemployed in the Starbucks because they possess a postgraduate in degree in sociology? Or is it that they're seeking a college degree for something that is quite unrelated to the work? that they're currently doing. And I think that's one of the questions that we would need to unpack as universities. But to the broader proposition as to what do we do amidst these trends in the immediate uh, present, I would also agree with uh, Peter Hodge that we, we do partner with industry. In our case, what we've sought to do is explicitly incorporate industry certifications into particular degree programs. So if it is Google or IBM or Microsoft, which has a particular credential, uh, a micro-credential or a certificate in a particular area, we incorporate that within the course with which it is most suited. So in lieu of one of our own exams or assessments, that credential counts as the assessment in a particular course. Of course, this cannot be done across every program, but where possible, we've done this, again, as a, as a means of providing value addition for the student, because one of the big complaints that employers make is that they have to retrain a student from scratch and give them the credential that is most suited to the workplace, despite whatever degree or diploma they come from the university with. So to eliminate that problem, if we incorporate the, the credential from the industry into the degree itself, there is no need for that retraining or duplication effort. So that's at least that's the concept. And that's why we've done that to the extent possible. The second thing is, not everything is instrumental, right? I mean, one of the things from the rising need for flexibility and the work from home movement that the COVID pandemic has enabled. I mean, you look at the surveys, 70 to 80% of all workers now say they want to work from home at least part of the time. And every employer is having to respond to this. So if that is the case, how do we teach them teamwork? How do we teach them resilience? How do we teach them the things that will enable them to be successful work at homers, so to speak. And that's not something that every university currently has done or, or has been prepared to do. So that will be a challenge that we will um, seek to tackle in the near future is how to prepare workers when working from home is the norm rather than the, the exception. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, over to Professor Tan. Tan, I want uh, your priorities definitely for the academic year. Uh, and also, you are also a member of Singapore's Future Economy Council, which is tasked with driving the growth and transformation of the country's future economy. The role of digital technology in your uh, Singapore's Future Economic Council, if you can just briefly elaborate this too. So uh, I spoke about the uh, disruptions in our industry. So uh, as part of the calibrated uh, approach that Singapore uses. Uh, we look at uh, 23 industries that uh, would account for more than 90% of the workforce in Singapore. And in each of this industry, uh, we look at the possible disruptions and also the interventions that need to be uh, given, particularly in the skill sets, the new skill sets that are needed for each of this industry. And so for each of this industry, there is actually a carefully calibrated new skill sets that are needed, right? And uh, 
universities like NUS, uh, together with private providers, are encouraged to provide programs to enable people in each of these 23 industries to scale up, right? So that the industry can have enough of the competent uh, workers to transform. Uh, and uh, in each of this industry, uh, we work quite closely with what are called Queen Bees. Queen Bees are big companies, all right? Uh, and by virtue of their size, right, they would already have a good sense on how they are going to move, what sort of new skill sets are needed. And they would have, in some sense, a good sense and also some good preparation in terms of the training of their own, own workforce. But universities, I think we have much uh, more sort of uh, commensurate capabilities. So we partner with Queen Bees. All right, to provide programs for the industry. And if we get the Queen Bees to buy in, uh, and Singapore government has a, a very good scheme. Uh, in 2014, uh, the Skills Future Initiative was being initiated to help upgrade the skill sets of workers in Singapore. Uh, and it comes to very generous support, like, uh, you, if you are age 40 and below, uh, the government pro provides about 70% of the training costs. If, sorry, about 70, yes. And if you are age 40 and above, because a lot of people tend to be retrenched uh, above age 40, particularly a lot of our professionals, managers, and executives, uh, the sponsorship is about 90%. There is actually a huge chunk of funding uh, to the tune of about a billion dollars a year with the sole purpose of actually upgrading the skills of workers. And universities can leverage on these funds to provide training for the workers. So this is part of one aspect where universities like NUS can play a role in upgrading the competencies of our workers. And the push towards technology enhanced learning would mean that we would be able to make this available to uh, workers in the region and in fact, in any part of the world. So this is one aspect which uh, uh, we are working on and uh, pushing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. Uh, over to Professor Danjay, uh, your final concluding words on your top priorities for this academic year. So our new academic year will start on the 15th of November. And uh, so we will uh, start on uh, a blended mode. That is, uh, all the lectures will be delivered online and we'll have uh, practicals, tutorials, uh, uh, face to face. And uh, so this is about what all other universities will be doing. And uh, this year, we're going to, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, push further on our main objective of digital transformation, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, that is making sure that processes, tools and people are all, uh, you know, uh, working hand in hand. Uh, so that is, uh, that is a, a very important point. Uh, a second point is uh, we are put, putting a lot of efforts into, uh, we have already done that, we've put uh, in place five in university industry clusters uh, and uh, uh, our, our academics and industry people are working closely together. They have identified problems that uh, they need university uh, help to solve. So we hope that uh, those five clusters in uh, uh, five different areas uh, 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 from agriculture to tourism, to health, to smart manufacturing uh, will lead to uh, tangible and concrete results. And uh, uh, we also, uh, you know, pushing further on the uh, sustainable development goals because we see the sustainable development goals as a real framework for uh, you know, action. And uh, if we're able to develop 
the Sustainable Development Goals in a very targeted manner. That is uh, uh, not doing things that please us as universities, but responding really to UN, uh, UN Agenda 2030. Uh, I think uh, the university's contribution will be very much uh, appreciated and uh, will be, uh, uh, we, we'll, we, we will in fact respond to what society is expecting of us. And uh, fourthly, uh, uh, as everybody mentioned, I see that, uh, you know, the role of our universities have uh, uh, largely changed from a purely uh, knowledge, uh, you know, institution to one that should also ensure that the students get employed. Uh, so uh, we have to find new ways of working uh, in the new normal so that our students you know, can find employment. This is uh, something very important for a small country like ours to ensure that our students you know, are, uh, you know, they invest in, in free four years education, but they're also employed at the end of the day. So that is uh, all I have to say. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I sincerely uh, thank you, Professor Peter Hodge, AC President and Vice Chancellor of University of Adelaide from Australia. Professor Sandeep Gopalan, Vice Chancellor of Carolina University from USA. Uh, Professor Tanning Chi, uh, President of National University of Singapore. And Professor Danjay Jari, Vice President of University of Mauritius. Thank you for joining the panel discussion and sharing the insights with us. Thank you everyone for bringing out the important points to think over, a very insightful discussion. Stay tuned and keep tweeting using the hashtag ETGEISS. Now we'll take a short break. Mm -hmm.